love it or hate it, politics is an escapable part of our pro-life mission. And I'm a big, big fan of the Brett Bartism where it said politics is downstream from culture um, because I firmly believe that is true. But culture change isn't the end all be all. We need laws on our books that declare without a shadow of a doubt that human life is special and should be protected for all Americans, including preborn Americans. Hey, Pro Life Jen, I'm Kristen Hawkins. Welcome to this very special episode of the Explicitly Pro Life podcast. My guest today, who will be joining me, Josh Craddock, knows quite a lot about the ins and outs of abortion politics, abortion laws. He is an affiliated scholar with the James Wilson Institute. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he served as the editor in chief of the prestigious Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. He also co founded the more prestigious Law Students for Life group. There. Uh, prior to law school, Josh managed advocacy teams for nonprofit organizations at the United Nations, participated in negotiation for sustainable development goals. I don't know what that is. Um, his, his writing has appeared at many esteemed outlets. He is a true pro, and I have a lot of hard questions for him today. Hey, Chris, Josh. Thanks great for to coming. see you today. Thanks Look, for having me. You got like all the stuff. So we're going <laughs> to dig into this. Ready to go. I'm so excited to have you on. I've been wanting to have you on the show for a while. I'm so. glad um, to be able to join you. Able to make it work. You know, one of the things I love about you is that you you dream big. A lot of times I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of biased against lawyers. I wanted <laughs> to be one until then I met a bunch of other free law students. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't for me. But one of the things that drives me crazy about lawyers is it's always like this like, no, like the, it's always like the spirit of no. And I'm like, no, yes, find me the yes, find me the legal way that we can do this. And, but what's the big vision here? And I think, you know, the writings I've read that you, you've written over the years when you were at Harvard and now since you, you, you dream big about what's possible for how we can protect the preborn federally. Yeah. And that's a big issue right now, especially with the midterms we had some GOP pro-lifers, you know, saying, oh, you know, do with the Dobbs decision, abortion is no longer a federal issue. Mm -hmm. What say you to that? Yeah, I think that the 14th Amendment is really important here. I think that it's important that we as pro-lifers remember that after the overturn of Roe and Casey, after Dobbs, there's still a federal role in abortion policy. And actually, uh, the 14th Amendment, I, I try to make the constitutional case for life, that okay. the 14th Amendment's guarantees of due process and equal protection of the laws apply to any person, including unborn persons. Okay, and then doesn't the pro-abortion movement, don't they also say that their right to kill babies is in the 14th Amendment? Yeah, so Can you break down like their argument? Yeah, yeah, it's incredibly perverse because this amendment that was designed to be comprehensively protective of all persons mm -hmm. uh, was actually used for the last 50 years to deny personhood and to say that through the due process clause, uh, that the, the meaning of the word liberty uh, somehow included abortion. And so yeah. the Dobbs opinion was so important because it, it finally put an end to that, uh, that line of constitutional law and declared once and for all that there is no constitutional right to abortion and that the 14th Amendment doesn't in any way guarantee abortion. And so now we're back to a place where, uh, where, where we know that there's no constitutional right to abortion, mm -hmm. uh, but states by implication are just kind of, you know, trying to figure out where their policies lie. And it's important that actually the federal government, the, the Constitution actually provides a benchmark by which states are to be judged, which is whether they're extending the equal protection of the laws to all persons within their jurisdictions. Okay, so in your in your ideal, where does the pro-life movement go from here in this moment? Because we are in that moment where states, you know, your your personhood is now going to be determined, you know, what part of the country, what county yeah. you may even be born into. And that's, you know, kind of reminiscent to other times in our nation's history that it didn't end up so well. Yeah, absolutely. You can think of Stephen Douglas, right, yep. in in the pre-Civil War days where he was advocating for popular sovereignty. He said he didn't care which way states voted up or down on slavery, uh, but, you know, as long as the people decided. And it was actually Abraham Lincoln who came back and said, no, it matters that the, that the black American is a man. 
mm -hmm. that he's a member of the he's a member of the human family and he has dignity. And so, no, you know, that would actually vitiate democracy. Uh, democracy doesn't have legitimacy if the majority is denying the rights to the minority. And so I think that we can fall into a similar trap where we could say like, oh, it's just for the states to decide. Because that was really the talking point of like yeah. a lot of people post-Roe of like, yeah. you know, abortion's been rightly thrown back to the states. But you're mm -hmm. saying, no, that's actually, we should not be saying that. Yeah, well, every state has an obligation to protect the people within its borders, right? So it's great that states are passing pro-life laws, and they should be. They, we, mm -hmm. we actively encourage states to protect the unborn. Um, but that's not, the end, that's not the final say if a state doesn't want to protect. Mm -hmm. uh, protect. Yeah, because I mean, this is important because, you know, we've got a lot of low hanging fruit right now. The American South, we've got like, almost 16 states that are completely abortion free, I yeah. think. I lose track because like we pass one and then, you know, one <laughs> state Supreme Court justice finds right. a right. Yeah. So, but we're on our way. And I think, you know, our, our kind of mapping out of a post row world kind of said that you could pretty quickly get to 25, 26 states that have protections. But, you know, and then I'll, you know, I'll be on the phone with somebody from California. Like, yeah, but it doesn't include me. I mean, Gavin Newsom's like running to be the, abortion president in chief um i mean it's crazy so we will have to employ a federal solution to protect pre-born life in california yeah i'm from the state of colorado where we have uh, late-term abortionists working yeah. that do abortions through all nine months of pregnancy uh, state law is very hostile and so this i think offers hope this vision of and understand the equal protection. Okay. Uh, this offers hope for people like me in Colorado, uh, folks in California, people in places like New York. Uh, and I think that it's important to note that this argument isn't new. It's actually been around even since the time of Roe v. Wade. So the state of Texas actually, in its oral arguments, uh, defended the, the concept that the unborn child is a person within the meaning of the amendment. Okay. And uh, they didn't have a lot of historical research to back that up at that time, but they were making the argument. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was foreign. Uh, but in the decades since, we've actually developed this breadth of historical understanding, looking at, you know, everyone's, uh, you know, very careful to be like originalist, right? Looking at the original meaning yeah. of the constitution. Yeah. And so now we have this wealth of historical information about what the, the meaning of that amendment was, the original public understanding of the amendment uh, in 1868 when it was adopted. And so we have this massive line of historical evidence, whether it's from uh, dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time the amendment was adopted, uh, the history of the common law and statutory reforms on abortion leading up in the, between 1820 and 1880. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, kind of the statements of the drafters of the amendment, what they intended to do, and mm -hmm. the comprehensive sweep that they expected it to have, not just you know as directly applied to the situation at hand, which when it was adopted, it was primarily addressed to trying to prevent uh, the extrajudicial killings of African-Americans in the South, right? You had the KKK and states were just standing by as this you know, swath of violence was going through. Yeah. And so that's why we adopted the 14th Amendment to ensure that states would have this obligation to extend the equal hmm. protection of the laws. Okay, so what do we need to do? Like, what do we do? How do we get federal equal protection applied? Is it we've got to pass certain legislative law, you know, laws in states and then get a case up to the Supreme Court where the court then says, like, why didn't they just do that in Dobbs? Wouldn't it make yeah, more sense? That's a great question. So why they didn't do it in Dobbs? Usually I'm like the Supreme layman Court. version of trying to take what you say and like, for the rest <laughs> of us. Well, I'm slowly processing it. No, so th that's a great question. And, and people might wonder that. Uh, so neither party in the case uh, raised this argument. The sole question in the case was whether all pre-viability uh, bans on abortion are unconstitutional, right? And so the, the Supreme Court took that question and they only addressed that question. Usually there's a call the doctrine of party presentment. So yeah. usually the Supreme Court isn't going to opine on things that the parties themselves Unless don't raise. Unless a bunch of, bunch of liberals are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it's supposed to be, a, you know, supposed yeah. to be a doctrine. And so, yeah. uh, and so generally they're not gonna opine on arguments that aren't made. Okay. And so this was not an argument that was raised, it was a more modest proposition, and it was just whether, uh, ultimately, whether there was a constitutional right to abortion. And okay. so, so, so precisely stated, the holding of Dobbs is that there is no constitutional right to abortion. And so by implication, that's gone back to the states, but it leaves an opening for the question of personhood. So what do we need to pass? So I need, yeah. so we're trying to pass a action 
uh, we call them life at conception loss. So mm-hmm. the, our first one was uh, Arkansas, then last year in Oklahoma, and now we're trying to get one introduced in Nebraska. Some people are mad because they want to do a heartbeat law and I'm messing up their plans or whatever yeah. um, because those laws are complete bans. Uh, in, in Nebraska, it's a criminal penalty for an abortionist mm-hmm. to commit uh, an abortion. Nebraska might have to be a civil or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, like, is it that type of law we need to get passed or is it something different? Well, so I think that every branch and level of government has actually a role to play here. Okay. So I think the states are important. Uh, role, you know, it, recognizing that they have an obligation under the 14th Amendment to establish equal protection. Okay. Um, but there's also a federal role and, it's, and that's in all three branches. Uh, So Section 5 of the 14th Amendment envisions that the primary enforcer of the amendment's guarantees would be Congress. And so Congress Mm -hmm. actually has an enumerated power that they can rely on in Section 5 that allows them to, quote, enforce by appropriate legislation the guarantees of the amendment. And so Congress today could actually pass a law directed to the state denial of equal protection uh-huh. and ensure that states so basically knows. prohibit states from having these permissive abortion laws. So that's a federal power that's granted, enumerated in the Constitution. Uh, the executive branch has a role to play in constitutional interpretation. Uh-huh. And so uh, as you might remember that uh, President Ronald Reagan back in the 80s actually made a proclamation mm-hmm. uh, saying that, that unborn children were persons within the meaning of the amendment. And actually the the Republican Party platform since 1984 has actually said that Congress should pass legislation too. I'm just saying that aside. Uh, But the president has a big role to play here. So in executive orders, and the president is the head of the executive branch, right? All these agencies and departments report to him or her. And the president gets a big say in constitutional interpretation through the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, and the OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel. And so for the president to make a determination that the unborn child is a person. Uh, I wrote a paper called The Lincoln Proposal, drawing on the inspiration of President Lincoln uh, and his example in ignoring Dred Scott and recognizing black Americans as citizens. Um, So that's that's a great example where actually policy can be made through the executive branch. And then finally in the judiciary, right? We have cases that come up all the time raising equal protection claims and the, the, the judiciary should vindicate those rights as well. And so that might come up in a, in a case like, for example, there are many states right now that are litigating whether there's a state constitutional right to abortion, yes, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And so a state could defend by saying, not only is there no state constitutional right to abortion, but even if there was, the 14th Amendment is supreme over, right? This U.S. Constitution is supreme over state constitution. Right, it's our federal structure. And so they can rely on the U.S. Constitution's guarantees of equal protection too, to trump any purported state constitutional right to abortion. Okay, that's a lot to digest. I'm following it. I'm just hoping everyone else is, I mean, so, okay, so we need to pass a law declaring equal protection. We need Congress to do it. That would be awesome. That's, that's, Has that, that been there? Be- I mean, we have our Life at Conception Act that we're pushing pretty hard for, yeah. which is like, no, at the moment of conception, you need co-living human life. Is, yeah. Would that and, cover and, it? And the authority that they would be relying on to pass that legislation yeah. would be through Section 5, okay. because that is an element of, uh, of enforcing the equal protection guarantee. So if we would, we, I mean, it, the Life and Conception Act, we had, I mean, there was over 100, yeah. it was almost 200 co-signers at one yeah. point. Um, now that we have the opportunity to actually pass it, I have a feeling it's going to be harder to get a lot of those same co-signers because <laughs> it's much easier to co-sign something when it's not going to pass than when you know it could pass. That's always how it goes. Um, would that, once that would pass, it would, I guess, go to the Supreme Court because, I mean, we'd have to get the Senate, then the president would veto it. Oh, yeah, so, so much you, more work to do. Yeah, yeah. 2024. Passing, passing legislation is difficult. Um, yes. There's also, you know, uh, the state, you know, the state, state attorney, attorney, attorney general would sue. Yeah, yes. and, and that's how you would get it. In the, and actually, it's interesting that the Dobbs decision getting kind of getting back to that. Um, I think in the majority opinion, it's really interesting how the majority opinion actually brings us closer toward recognizing personhood. So even uh-huh. though there's a lot of dicta about returning it to the states, right, because that's the the necessary implication of the precise holding of Dobbs. Um, There's a lot of five times, actually, the majority opinion distinguishes other what they call substantive due process cases. Uh, So those are the cases you might be familiar with, with uh, Griswold, uh, Lawrence v. Texas, uh, Obergefell. They fall into this doctrinal bucket called substantive due process. 
And so the court distinguished all those cases by saying those cases are different because abortion takes a human life, essentially. They say uh, what, the, what Roe and Casey called fetal life and what the Mississippi law describes as an unborn human being. So they mentioned that five times in the majority opinion. Oh. And so I think that that moves us closer toward a centrality in the Dobbs holding mm -hmm. that abortion is different because it takes a human life and it raises the question, well, is that, that human life a person? And since there is no, in law, there's no distinction between a human being, a living human being and a natural person, mm -hmm. a legal person, uh, then there is, since there is no so such there distinction. there is no distinction in the law. Yeah, going back to even Blackstone, actually. So William Blackstone was this famous commentator uh, who basically every founder had a copy of Blackstone's commentaries on their shelf as, as their law source. Uh -huh. uh, and in his first chap first book is called The Rights of Persons in his commentaries. In the first chapter of that book, he actually begins the discussion with a discussion of the rights of the unborn child. Uh -huh. And he said that life begins in contemplation of law as soon as the child is able to stir in its mother's womb. And that mention is of stirring is actually designed to protect human life as soon as it could be detected and not to exclude protection prior to that point. So it was an evidentiary rule to show that because necessary to showing the crime of abortion was showing that an unborn child had actually been killed. And so the, the law is always recognized that as soon as life can be shown to exist, legal personhood exists also. Hmm. So why, what are we missing right now from the reversal of Roe what is the other side up to? Because I mean, they, some people, some of them probably watch this. I mean, they're probably like, yep, that's what we're stopping. You know, where do you see their legal movement going in the pro-abortion movement? I, I, the trend that I've seen so far is an attempt to try and create similar sort of Roe v. Wade decisions in all of the states through okay. state courts. And so they're trying to yeah. stop pro-life laws by saying, uh, there's a state constitutional right to abortion, and some state courts are going along with it, unfortunately. Now, the what do we is, do from there? Like, yeah. so, like when the South of Carolina recently, they invalidated, I think it was the heartbeat law mm -hmm. that we had worked for, and then they were like, nope, there's a constitutional right or something. Yeah. Why is the recourse for conservatives and pro lifers at that point? So, we, that's, that's why we have to have a federal option, whether it's through Congress, a pro life president. Uh, through, through the federal courts to vindicate the equal protection and due process rights. Uh, and then we also need to fight in the states and have a better uh, strategy for how we're going to ensure that there are judges who actually mm -hmm. care about state constitutions as well. Because, yeah. uh, you know, there's been a conservative legal movement that's been very effective in the federal judiciary. Oh, yeah. uh, and we really need state courts to have that same sort of, uh, same sort of structure. And I think it's important for folks to understand that some state Supreme Courts are appointed yeah. And some of them are elected. Yeah. So like in Florida, I mean, I, we posted a graphic on Students for Life and it was just like the number of abortions in all the states. And Florida was third highest. Florida mm -hmm. was very popular. People were like mad at me because we like, were like, Florida's the Republican safe haven. I'm like, okay, it's still like a huge abortion state. And then yeah. people were very upset that we said that. And I'm like, well, no, it, it's historically has been that way because their Supreme Court has been so terrible. Mm -hmm. And thankfully with Governor DeSantis, he was able to appoint one or two, must have multiple, yeah. you know, so now, you know, they finally passed last year a 15 week bill. Hopefully this year they do the right thing and do a life conception or maybe heartbeat. Yeah. Um, and so we're starting to see progress there, but that was because there, there had been lifetime appointments made yeah. and that's a huge problem. Yeah, so Florida is a great example because their Supreme Court is probably going to soon consider this same state constitutional right question. Mm -hmm. And so personnel is really important. The fact that there are new justice, state court justices yeah. there uh, who are ready to reconsider an older Florida okay. Supreme Court decision that was, again, kind of like Roe v. Wade made out of whole cloth from the, the, the Florida Constitution. So Written now, invisible ink. Exactly, yeah. So now you have better justices in the state courts. And now what we also need is people who are defending the law in the, from the state of Florida to not only say that there's no state constitutional right to abortion, but also to appeal to the 14th Amendment. And that's why you law. need, that's why when you when we say vote pro life first, it is literally all levels of government. Yeah. It's not just, I mean, what you've illustrated today, we have to have a pro-life president, we have to have a pro-life Senate, we have to have a pro-life U.S. House representative, you need a pro-life governor, you need a pro-life attorney general, because those are the folks that defend, you know, like, yeah. oh, that's a lot of work. Yeah, and to be <laughs> clear, you don't have to have all of those at the same time because there's different things that they can do, mm -hmm. but it's so important to have all of them 
just because they're, they each have different powers in their authority to move the ball forward. Okay, so we have a few more minutes. And I hope everybody had their caffeine before this episode. If not, you may want to pause uh, and just get some caffeine. So I guess if you were sitting, I have to go up to Capitol Hill right after this. And I don't think I'm going to have to have a discussion, but I don't know. Um, what is the, if you were sitting in front of, I won't name names, a U.S. senator that lives in a Rust Belt state that almost lost re-election, but won, but skin of his chin 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 uh, came out and said before the election, you know, this is, you know, I'm totally pro-life. I've always been pro-life, but this is no longer a federal issue. Mm-hmm. If you were staying across from him right now, what would you tell him? Yeah, I, I think the answer is that it has to be a federal issue uh, because for numerous reasons. One, because the 14th Amendment specifically says equal protection for, quote, any person and persons includes the unborn. So there is a federal issue there. Um, Second, I think that the federal government's not getting out of abortion anytime soon because you look at what the Biden administration is doing, for example, through their regulations, their rules, their agencies, uh, they're promoting abortion on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. And so to think that just because on a legislative level, oh, Dobbs has been decided, so go back to your states, talk to your states, that's not an answer because the federal government is still so deeply involved in promoting abortion and Congress needs to step up and have something to say about it and to enforce, to fulfill their constitutional obligations Mm. to stop abortion. So I think that's, I think that's- That's a very nice way to say, suck it up and man up. That's basically what's gonna be my, (laughs) it's gonna be my comment. So I'll just like, yeah, I just need to write, I'm just writing down some things you said for my (laughs) meeting. Uh, Because I think that it's, it's so clear. I mean, the Biden administration, so sadly and beautifully is demonstrating the power of having a pro-abortion president and and using all these federal agencies, using your power to advance this radical abortion agenda. I mean, I I get so frustrated every time we get into election season of the pro-life liberal, whatever you want to call yourself, you know, I'm a pro-life whatever. Just hate that because it's like, I'm just pro-life. I don't care what your other labels are, whatever. (laughs) But it's like, well, now it doesn't matter. We don't need to, it doesn't matter. The a president doesn't do anything. It's pointless. There's a pro-life group, I don't even know if they're still pro-life, that says that. it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. No, it matters. Yeah. What we're seeing right now with chemical contraceptive drugs now being going to pharmacies, right now it's you may uh, apply. Next, it's going to be you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's you must. And then it's going to be over the counter. It's going to be taxpayer funded. Like we know exactly where this is going. And they're using the federal agencies, Biden's weaponized FDA to do that. And so mm-hmm. it's 100% abortion is still a federal issue. Uh, and so we as pro-lifers have to be ready to be engaged in 2024. Um, it's my passion plea to sign up at Students for Life Action right now and volunteer because we've got to we've got to elect a pro life president. We have to elect a pro life U.S. Senate, and then obviously work in our states to elect pro life governors. Yeah, and once we elect them, then we have to hold them to it, right? And so have a pro life president and tell them, you know, show them the example of never be satisfied. Proclamation, and then show what they can do through those executive agencies, All through right. their executive orders. So where can like someone go and get like, do you have your like Josh Craddock step yeah. to abolishing abortion throughout <laughs> our land? Well, you can read my law review article that I did publish in the Harvard okay. Journal of Law and Public Policy if you want to try and you know make sense of the historical. I, I know I've read it at that. least twice, <laughs> but that's why I wanted you on because it's, it's harder to read and I keep getting stopped. I'm yeah. a mom, so I get stopped and started on these. Yeah, but if you, if you look at, I also had a recent piece with uh, Professor Robert George from Princeton in the Washington Post. And that kind of just lays out in very simple terms what Congress's authority is and why they have an obligation to ensure equal protection. Uh, So those are kind of some resources that you can look into, both academic and just more accessible. Uh, So that's what I would recommend. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on today and sharing with us um, your uh, your thoughts and just this wealth of expertise and knowledge that you have. It's such an honor. And I'm so glad that you co-founded the Harvard Students for Life group to know that you guys have like this amazing law students for life entity that's still in existence, yeah. that's going on, that's, you know, activating future Josh's. It's it's incredible. <laughs> so you guys will you will certainly play a big part in abolishing. Yeah, well, I'm so thankful for Students for Life and the fact that we were <laughs> able to start that at Harvard Law. It created amazing conversations on campus and, and really uh, changed things, I think. 
Well, thank you for joining me today. And thanks for joining us today. Make sure you like and share this episode and rewatch it because I'm going to.